In this video, I'm going to show you how to rebuild the signature pieces of a film LUT right here inside of DaVinci Resolve. Let's dive in and let's go right over to the timeline section of our node graph, which is where we are going to be building all of these components of our film look, because we want this to be a look that affects not just some of the shots in our timeline, but all of the shots in our timeline. That's exactly what we want to use this timeline section of the node graph for. Now, the first few pieces of this film look, I'm going to go through kind of fast because I've talked about them a lot here on the channel. And even though they're the most important parts of a film look, they're also the parts that we've talked about the most. So if you want to go deeper into these first few ingredients, just know there's lots of other content here on the channel where you can learn more about the creative contrast curve and the split toning that we are going to start this process off with. So for our creative contrast curve, I'm going to go to my gallery and go to a power grade that I have saved for DaVinci Wide Gamut Gray. And I'm going to go over here to node number two, go to my custom curves, and I'm going to eyedropper on the gray patch here in my viewer so that I get this single control point here in my custom curves. And I'm now going to tap node, two, uh, node number two rather, and hit Command C, then hit Option S to create a new serial node and hit Command V. So I've now got a second node that already has this anchor point for my DaVinci Wide Gamut Gray. And this is simply going to ensure that as I start making adjustments in nodes two and three here, I've got an anchor point that is keeping my middle exposure at the proper position and not inadvertently biasing it up or down. It's a very important thing when you're doing look development. You want to make sure that you are leaving mid gray at its input state, unless you have an explicit reason to move it. That's something we could talk about on another day. Now that we've got this pulled in, I'm going to take this DaVinci Y gamut gray node and wipe it out. I don't need it anymore. And we're just going to go in and fill out these first two ingredients. We're going to do our overall creative contrast curve using this anchor point. So I'm just going to pick up my floor a little bit, drop down my toe, get kind of a filmic level of compression down there. We'll do a similar thing up here in the high end, drop that high end, bring up and create sort of a shoulder in the image. And I can go a little bit further here. Maybe I lifted that floor up a little bit too far on the shadow side and up here on the high end. Again, maybe I can go a little bit further. And I'm going to be flipping through throughout our look dev process today. Lots of different shots, all the different shots in my timeline to make sure that what I'm doing fits not just one particular shot, but all the shots that we are building our look for here today. So that's a pretty decent start there. Maybe I can go a hair deeper still on that toe. And there's my curve. Now we're going to go in and do our split toning. Lots of different ways we could do this, but the way we're going to do it today is with two simple adjustments. We're first going to go to our shadows and just subtract red. That's going to leave green and blue. So we're going to have kind of some cyan -y shadows. And then if we go over to our blue channel, we're going to subtract that from the top end. That's going to give us red and green remaining. So we're going to kind of have some goldy highlights, right? So that's all we're going to do for our split toning. And again, going to flip between all the different images in my timeline here and just make sure that this is sort of working across all these different images. Now, what we've done just here, these are the fundamental pieces of a film look. And like I said, we've talked about them in the past. So I want to go a little bit further than just these simple pieces here today. I'm going to label this split. And the next thing that I want to show you is uh, what we can think of as creating the kind of saturation version of what we were doing here with this creative contrast curve. This is where we're going to create a sort of similar shoulder shape to what you see here in the curve, where we're driving things up, 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 and then they're flattening out as you're getting to a particular level. We're going to do that for our saturations now by right clicking node number one, going to color space and selecting HSV like so. And we're going to do this in two pieces for this first one in our HSV mode with HSV as our space and channels one and three turned off. This is something we've done here on the channel lots. Basically with this setup, I'm only operating on the S or the saturation channel of my HSV. And in this mode, I can drive my gamma up. Now stick with me because this is going to look kind of crazy for a minute. Okay. I'm going to go sort of far with this. I'm going to go up to like a 0.09 or so on my gamma, which is a lot in uh, this saturation mode that we're making our adjustment. But we're now going to follow this. We're going to call this HSV. Now we're going to do another serial node similar, except now we're going to be in HSL because I want to gain down in uh, this HSL node when I finish getting set up here. And what this is essentially going to do, this combination of gamma up gain down is going to create that shoulder shape that I'm looking for. 
And this is something that you're going to see in any film system, by the way, in any film print, you're going to see saturations that take off really strongly from neutral. So like low medium saturations, things like skin tone are going to have lots and lots of life to them. But the peak saturation of that system is actually going to be fairly low or medium. So that sat curve is something that you see in any film system where it feels very colorful right up until you don't have any color left. That's kind of what we're trying to mimic here today. So we've got the first part of that. We've got lots of color now, don't we, with this HSV gamma up move that we did. Now we're going to take our gain in this HSL mode and we're going to pull things back down. And this is really where we want to, first of all, label so we can keep ourselves straight on what's happening. And now we can grab both of these pieces and flip them on and off and see what we're getting. And I think that looks really nice, certainly nice and filmic. And something else you can do if you want is like, let's go even further with this. Let's really go crazy. Lots of gamma up, lots of gain down. All right. And once you've got these kind of like responding in a reasonable way, you can actually right click these two nodes and create a compound node. And you could call this whatever you want. You could call it your sat if you wanted. And now you've got one knob that you can use to drive this entire system. So let's say we only want 65% of that. I can achieve this by going to my key output gain here under my uh, key settings, set that to a 0.65. If you have a control surface like I do, then you can even adjust it here on the control surface and essentially scale that down up or down, I should say, uh, and get a modulated level of that saturation adjustment and sort of modulate it to taste with a single knob. So to me, this is one of the other key signatures of a film system that like very colorful response followed by a rollover or a flattening as you approach a certain saturation level. So play around with that, incorporate it. I think you're going to find that you really like what you're able to get out of that. And I want to emphasize as we move on to kind of the last adjustment that we're going to be looking at here today, everything that you are learning, if this is your first time getting exposed to look development, which by the way, is really the discipline that we are exploring here today. You're going to learn a lot by going through and experimenting with the things I'm showing you here today. I'm going to encourage you to not necessarily go out there and throw these things on your next project and use them as your film emulation, but rather use this as a way of better understanding film emulation or film LUTs when you do use them. And if anything, go do your level best to build something in this domain using these tools and then compare it to a uh, well-trusted look LUT that you uh, like that comes from a reputable source, something like my Kodak 2383. That's a free download you can grab in a uh, link that I'll leave in the description for today's video or my Voyager Pro or Essentials Pack. Trusted LUTs, trusted looks that do really nice things to your image that come from credible sources. Check those out and then check out what you did. And if you like what you did just as much and you feel like it's just as strong, that means that your look dev game is getting pretty strong and you're ready to start doing look dev at a professional level. But until you reach that point, until you feel like your look is beating the uh, reference look that you're using, the reputable and uh, you know like trusted look that you are comparing to, go ahead and use the trusted look and chalk up what you're doing right now to practice. This is how you get good at look dev. Take it from me. I've done this exercise thousands and thousands of times, and this is how I built up my look dev chops. So the value in what you're doing today may not be that, oh, now I can build a look that feels and tastes just as good as my favorite film LUT. That might happen, uh, but if it doesn't, then know that the real value in what we're exploring today is a set of principles that you can continue exploring for the duration of your uh, career in color grading and look dev. That's certainly been my path anyway. So with that said, let's go through and do our last adjustment here. For this last one, we're gonna play around with our RGB mixer a little bit. And really what I wanna mess around with, I'm gonna go back to shot number one for this one. What I wanna mess around with is thinking about biasing my hues a little bit. It's, uh, and in particular, I wanna try sort of warming my yellows. Like if you look at this yellow patch here, I'd like to see these yellows get uh, a little bit more warmer, rotate them a bit more toward like an orangey gold almost. Here's how we're gonna do that. We're going to go into the red output of our RGB mixer, and we're going to start by pulling blue from our red output, like so. And I'm just going to choose an arbitrary value. Let's do like a negative 0.08 or 09 in the blue. And now in our green, we are going to increase by that same amount, like so. And if you look at where we are netting out here, 
what you're going to see when I get these kind of balanced, it's actually important that you get these to roughly match each other. So if you pull 0.09 here, add 0.09 there, because for each of these red, green, and blue outputs, you generally want these to add up to a one. When they add up to a one, you're going to be preserving your neutrals and your results are going to feel a little bit cleaner. But if we take a look at what we've done here at our before and after, you can see I'm just subtly warming up my yellow vector and pushing it closer to my red vector. You can even see it in the vector scope. That whole side of the wheel is kind of rotating over a little bit, right? So that's just one example of the kind of fun that you can start to have with the RGB mixer and the way you can start to think about it creatively. Like, well, if I want to make my yellows a little bit more warm, I want to pipe some of my yellows into my red channel. What's a good way to do that? Add some positive green and subtract some blue because the complement of blue is actually yellow. So this is something that you can play with on like an explicit basis or on a more naive basis. And especially if you just apply the logic of like, all right, I'm going to make sure that my red output sums to one, which here it does. I'm doing one plus 0 0.09 minus 0 0.09. That sums to one, doesn't it? Same thing here with my green and my blue. If you impose that one constraint on yourself, you can get some really interesting results that still feel organic because your neutrals are being preserved. So if you look at what's happening here, again, this is something that I would call very filmic. And the next time you go back and look at my 2383 or any of the other, uh, any other, you know, like uh, trusted LUTs out there, film emulation LUTs that you like and know, go back and look at their character with fresh eyes based on what we studied here today. And you're going to see a lot of the characteristics that we have imparted into our image today. You're going to see that signature curve. You're going to see that split toning or that biasing of cool tones into the shadows and warm tones into the highlights. You're going to see your hues rotate the way we were doing in our matrix here. And you are definitely going to see the kind of saturation remapping that we did here in our sat node. But the really fun thing and the thing that's sort of ultimately waiting for us if we do decide to stick with look dev and continuing to improve is that there comes a certain point where not only will you be able to match your favorite looks, you actually can do things that your looks don't do or do something that isn't imparted in a look that you're using. And that's really the promise of look dev. That's a long journey and ultimately it's going to lead you outside of resolve and into far stranger territory. But this is a great way to begin exploring look dev. And even if you decide look dev is not for me, look dev is not the discipline I want to focus on. I want to focus on color grading. By the way, those are separate disciplines, even though they're highly related. The analogy I sometimes use is that look dev is more like building a guitar than it is like playing the guitar, while color grading itself is indeed more like playing the guitar. But this is a great start for exploring that. And if nothing else, it's going to make you more sensitized and better adapted to evaluating a film emulation LUT or frankly any look LUT and starting to look at, okay, what is it doing in terms of its contrast, in terms of its split tone, in terms of its sat curve, in terms of the way that hues are being remapped, you're really going to be able to assess those things better and determine, well, do I like that? Is that ideal for what I want, for what my client wants? Or is there something that's missing, something that's not quite right? And should I continue looking for a look that I can source from a, uh, another location, uh, possibly? So I hope that helps you uh, with a, a way of thinking about kind of getting inside the skin of a film LUT. I know that was a, a big urge that I had for many years when I was developing uh, as a colorist and as a look dev practitioner, as a creative color scientist, if you want to call it that. And this really helps you to explore that and uh, to get more inside the skin of a film LUT and get a sense for what it's doing in there so that you can better evaluate film LUTs and uh, start to explore building your own looks in the long run if that's something that you're serious about exploring. So I hope that helps you with starting to kind of get inside the skin of a film LUT. I know that was an urge that I had for uh, so many years when I was getting into color grading and later into look development and into really full on creative color science was to understand like what are the key elements? What are the key components that are driving this look that I find so compelling? And the things that we've looked at today are some of the core components that I've identified over the years that really do make up kind of the heartbeat of a film system, of a film look, and therefore of a really good film LUT. And from here, the truth is you may not beat 
a film let that you love tomorrow or even in a week, but you will start to understand what it is that's driving the looks and luts that you like and the individual components that are contributing to that look and to that LUT. And it's gonna make you a better colorist. It's gonna make you a better practitioner of your craft because you can see those individual pieces and you can make more empowered choices about the look that best serves your project.